Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today for the next Sherpa Funds Technology Process Alpha webinar. Uh, for those of you who are new to our Process Alpha webinars, my name is Stephen Quimby. I'm in charge of sales and marketing at Sherpa Funds Tech. Uh, joining us today to help walk us through this topic is my colleague, our founder and CEO, Richard Waddington. Uh, Richard, give the people a good hello. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be. Great to see people yes. here. I know we have a few people uh, like myself who are on lockdown in the, the US of A. Uh, so for those of you who are joining us somewhere in the uh, 8.30 to 11.30 p.m. window, uh, thank you for taking the time this evening. Uh, a lot of our folks obviously are in Asia today. Uh, so again, thanks for taking the time this morning to join us. Um, but today we're gonna be covering a topic, what does your best portfolio really mean? And so this is a topic that you know, when we talk about finding your best portfolio, when we talk about using portfolio construction tools to build a good portfolio, uh, we find that many PMs don't necessarily have great definition on this. So what we're going to walk through today is a, a framework that we use here at Sherpa to help PMs think about what they really mean when they say their best portfolio. Um, so in, in terms of kind of, you know, groundwork, again, for those of you who are new with us, so we'll take about half an hour, 25 minutes maybe to cover our topic today. Um, we'll try to do Q&A at the end, though certainly if you have any questions midstream, you're welcome to put them in the chat box. Um, if it comes up and it's just the right time for it, we might tackle it midway through, or else, like I say, feel free to hold on to those and we'll tackle any questions everyone has at the end. Uh, also, just as a note for those of you, if you lose connectivity, if you you know have to jump out, if something comes up, there's a trade going, market starts going crazy, uh, the replay will be hosted either tomorrow or the next day, uh, certainly fairly promptly on the Sherpa Funds Tech YouTube channel. And so we'll have the whole replay online if for some reason you miss out. So the, the topic today, like I said, what we're gonna talk about with what does your best portfolio really mean? First, we're gonna talk briefly about one of the sort of core components of how we view portfolio construction, which is what we call a candidate portfolios analysis. Uh, then we're going to talk about how we evaluate a given candidate portfolio. So how having created an array of potential portfolios, we evaluate each individual portfolio. Uh, next, we're gonna walk through which market data set we should be evaluating those portfolios on because obviously that has a significant impact to what we're going to see as the results of our evaluation. And then we're gonna walk through kind of how we can bring this all together in terms of evaluating portfolios across multiple different iterations of the market to find what is the best portfolio and to find a portfolio that really should be good and robust across many circumstances. And then, as I said, as we get to the end, we'll take questions. So. As we get started, you know, we had in our first webinars, how good is your portfolio? Again, up on our YouTube channel, uh, a whole session devoted to how we think about what we call candidate portfolios. And so when we talk about a candidate portfolio, candidate portfolio is the universe of portfolios. So it's one of the universe of portfolios that are compliant with the objectives and constraints on that portfolio and expressing the views that the PM wants to express with their asset choices. So this is essentially the universe of ways in which the PM could express their views while still complying with the operational and risk and return constraints set on them by their organization. And so candidate portfolios here are displayed in green. And so this is a sampling of many of the portfolios that could have been created using the same set of views and the same set of objectives and constraints. And so the ORS portfolio, which we view as the best portfolio in this case, increased returns in this case by 268 bips per annum without increasing risk, without increasing volatility and drawdown, and gave the PM much more exposure to their views, much more exposure to their higher conviction ideas. So when we think about finding the best portfolio out of a candidate portfolio, that leads us into what we're gonna talk about today, what we really mean by the best portfolio. So one thing that we find with many of the PMs we talk to, certainly the, the folks I talk to, and Richard, I know you've talked to people on this as well, uh, is that you know PMs have a wide array of tools of methodologies they can use to create a best portfolio. You know, a simple Markowitz mean variance op optimization up to a large technology package. And one of the things that I, many PMs we talk to struggle with is that they don't really know what those mathematical tools mean by best. And they don't necessarily know themselves what constitutes the best portfolio to them, to that individual PM. And so it's really important 
whether you're you know taking the sherpa approach or another approach it's very important to understand what is the best portfolio to you and then to understand the tools and the portfolio construction methodologies you're using to find or to generate to create that best portfolio and so the two main parts the two main components of this first how do we evaluate a portfolio so how do we look at a portfolio and determine is it good is this portfolio how do i compare apples to apples against my other portfolios and then second what sets of market data are we evaluating to make that analysis so what does the market performance look like across different potential evolutions um, so when we think about how to evaluate a portfolio so one of the things that makes it sometimes difficult to do an apples to apples comparisons on portfolios is that fund management has a million different metrics that people use to evaluate portfolios. So returns sliced and diced any number of ways, uh, volatility, drawdown, sharp, Sortino, you name it, there's a lot of different ways that people look at how they evaluate or how they quantify their portfolio. And each of these statistics has different descriptive characteristics. Each one you know, could be focused on the returns, could be focused on risk, could be focused on risk adjusted returns. But Practically speaking, to make an apples to apples comparison across multiple portfolios to determine which one is the best, really we need to drill down to a core evaluation metric that reflects the PM's lived experience of that portfolio in the market. So it reflects their lived experience of the changes in PL. And that, that specific metric needs to reflect that PM's priorities. And so that means their risk tolerance. At what point are they getting a tap on the shoulder? At what point are you uncomfortable with the amount of risk or the amount of drawdown you're taking? And then frankly, how much skill do you expect to have? How much return are you aiming to generate? What sort of risk adjusted returns? So the core things that we look at as the PM inputs to defining what is the best. First, we need to think about, you know, what is your expectation of return? And this can be, you know, a little bit fuzzy it can be very pinpoint accurate but really is there a particular target or expectation you have for returns second drawdown at what point are you uncomfortable or is it problematic with your drawdown because you know this can vary wildly i talked to some pms just the other day where you know 10 percent drawdown against their benchmark that's fine it's a really active concentrated strategy and they take big risks uh, another client i've been working with recently 300 basis points below his benchmark and he starts getting the heebie-jeebies. He gets really uncomfortable. So this drawdown tolerance is very unique to the PM and unique to the portfolio. And then finally, as we think about the, the volatility or the, the sharp, you know, the risk adjusted return, what's your expectation for your skill? You know, that target return, what are you expecting to get? And so with these parameters, we can start to define a function that we can evaluate, a nonlinear function that helps us evaluate our portfolio and evaluate the performance of our PL. So when we think about this, it's very important to you know set up right here that this should be an asymmetric function because. And frankly, if, if I was to use the, the simplest case, one of the largest hedge funds in the world, right? Notoriously tight risk controls at millennium. And if you're down more than 5%, you're getting a tap on the shoulder. You could be up 25%, but the next quarter you're down 5% and you're probably on the street. <laughs> so there's a very real amount of diminishing return to returns beyond a certain threshold. And there's a very real penalty to risk again as we approach whatever that drawdown or whatever those risk thresholds are and so as we think about how the risk tolerance is adjusted and as we think about those pm inputs those are going to shape this asymmetric curve it's going to be very important in making sure that the way we evaluate the portfolio reflects how it impacts that individual pm so as we think about this then so if we're using this utility function essentially what we're going to do is evaluate each period's return, so each day's return typically, but also could be a week, et cetera, against this utility function to determine the utility of, of that moment in time. And then as we sum up these utilities, that's going to give us a portfolio utility, a portfolio utility across that risk tolerance, across that asymmetric function, which gives us a very apples to apples comparison for different portfolios, different performances, different periods of time, because we can come down to that single metric.
metric that captures our risk and return objectives. So as we think about this, uh, that set then of portfolio utilities are easily compared and evaluating down to this portfolio utility gives us something that we can compare to determine what is in fact the best portfolio. So the next component here, um, what market data should, should we evaluate on? This, this is where we get into the serious mathematician stuff. And I have to, I have to kick it over to Richard to, to guide us through getting into the nitty gritty of our theoretical math about which market data set we use to evaluate this. Great, thanks, Stephen. Um, so yeah, no, very good though. I, as hopefully you, you can all see now what we're, we're getting at, right? So you start with a bunch of candidate portfolios. You recall the green lines on the very first or the second slide. And you evaluate each of them on a set of market data using the asymmetric risk function that best fits your experience as a PM. As Stephen said, some PMs have much broader risk uh, appetites and some have much more constrained downside. But broadly speaking, you will be able to say, actually, this is how I want to live my portfolio life. <clears throat> now, let's look at all the possible candidate portfolios, all the possible ways of expressing my views and evaluate each one of those on a set of market data to find which candidate portfolio is the best portfolio. In that conversation, we have left to the question of what set of market data do we evaluate on? This is the uh, the next stage. Oh, sorry. So, um, yeah, here we are. Um, really going forward, for, so the point in time when you have decided to construct a portfolio, you have two different dimensions upon which uncertainty can act. Right? So you have some sort of historical market data, and that's one set of market data. It captures a period of time, um, as long or short as you want to, separate. Uh, topic that. But two things going forward can uh, introduce uh, variance into the outcome. First one is uncertainty in the selection of assets that you have taken. You, you've picked a bunch of things. Maybe you've got a, I don't know, a 200 stock benchmark and you've picked 40 stocks. Uh, you have a view that those 40 will outperform the benchmark over the next period. Um, but you never know exactly, but there is within the fact that you have picked those 40, there is some information. Um, and then the second part is, well, what, how will the market actually move? I mean, we know the market is not going to repeat what it just did, but we want to say the market will retain some elements of its historical uh, behavior and, and the elements that we think are the most consistent over time, certainly within the rebalancing frequency of the manager would be the covariance structure of the market. So not the direction, but the way that things move together. This is the really important part of, uh, of, of asset uh, selection. So you can draw a picture of what market data set do you want to use? And you draw a picture and you say, okay, let's look at these two axes. We've got the axis of the uncertainty in asset selection on the Y axis and uh, in the market covariance on the X axis. Uh, and you can kind of say, okay, uh, so the bottom left, right, you've got uh, no uncertainty in asset selection, um, so uh, no, no information asset selection primarily, and no uncertainty in market variance, market covariance structure, meaning the market absolutely follows what it did before and there's no information in, in your asset picks. Um, top left would be you're always right, so you've always picked the assets that are going to do best and the market is entirely deterministic. Um, these are clearly not valid market data assumptions, although they are actually used in a lot of portfolio optimization uh, machines. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and practically speaking, implied by many other, even non-optimized technologies. The totally yeah, random well, approach is sort of what's implied by the equal weight methodology. Yes, exactly. The, the, you, you can take a portfolio that has been constructed by a method, and you can say, well, actually, that what that implies is this is what you think about the future. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so where do you want to be? Well, you know you want to be somewhere in this blue box, right? You, you've, you've got information in your asset selections. But you don't know exactly when or where you're going to be right, but broadly there is information. Um, 
So you have a sort of historical, this is, you take one asset, right? This is what it did in the past, but you think actually it's going to go up. So you need to create market data sets in which it goes up. And uh, you can create, you know, here's one, here's another one, here's another one. And in fact, you end up saying, okay, let's create a whole universe of market data sets in which this asset has uh, the same covariance as it had with everything else. We'll talk about that in a second. The same volatility as it's had in the past, unless you decide otherwise as a PM. Um, but broadly, it has uh, an upward or a trajectory that the average of all its possible trajectories is uh, statistically valid um, sample of how you think the world is going to uh, evolve. So your choice of having that asset in the portfolio actually implies something about the envelope in which that asset will perform. So any one of those little uh, light colored lines. Um, the next thing you think about is, well, how does that asset move with everything else? We want to say, well, you know, market covariance is generally stable, but it's not perfectly stable and it's not perfectly random. So you're somewhere in the middle. Again, uh, the, this box gives you a kind of region in which you want to be. Um, so if you take this is uh, all the, rather than one single asset, this is all the assets in the portfolio. And you know, th this is an equity portfolio. So there is a correlation between the assets. They're all um, I think this is a single sector portfolio. So things broadly thing you can say, okay, in the future, it could, the, all the assets could do this or sorry, they could do this or they could do this. These are all perfectly valid forward looking expectations of what the market could do, but none of, no one of them is, is definitely it? right. Sorry. One note there, the green lines here, that represents what we were just looking at with one asset. So that's that asset changing is just one small piece of the puzzle, right? Because we have to look at the individual asset path and we have to look at the interplay of the asset paths. We have to look, yes, exactly. We have to look at the individual asset path, creating forward evolutions of that asset that has the volatility and covariance characteristics of the market data, which we want to preserve, but has a return stream that matches in a statistical fashion across all possible evolutions where the PM has expectations of it going. Yeah, that, that makes sense. The PM's choice of that asset infers or, or puts information into the future evolution of where things could go. Um, so, if we go, yeah, so we've got lots of these market data sets. So each of those market data sets effectively exists in this sort of cloud in the middle of our, of our screen here. Um, our market data sets are neither guaranteed, you know, total stability nor complete randomness. They're not, we have no information and they're not, we have perfect information. But the market data sets we are evaluating our candidate portfolios on, so multiple candidate portfolios, multiple market data sets, all of which exist in a possible future, uh, all of which are uh, showing what possible future evolutions of the market could be. Um, and like we said, you know, if you have a, a, a model or a, 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 an approach which leads you to, you know, use this as the market data sets to evaluate, totally random with no information, then you, you're basically just noise, right? There's, there's no value in that. Uh, and basically anything in, in this low uh, Y axis area uh, shows that you're adding no value by being a PM, by choosing assets. Um, if, if you happen to pick this, the one that says MPT, Modern Portfolio Theory, um, if, you, if you happen to do that in 1954, you get a Nobel Prize for it. This is Markowitz. Um, if you're up here, it means you know exactly what's going to happen in the future and you, you don't need to speak to Sherpa. If, if you're up here, then good for you. <laughs> um, but where you really are, where pretty much all PMs genuinely live their lives is somewhere in here. You have some degree of knowledge about the future of your stocks. Uh, you don't know exactly where or when each stock is going to appear. 
wh what it's going to do. And you have some un understanding that the covariance structure of the market is broadly stable, but not perfectly stable. Um, and then when you combine these two things, combine the thing that Stephen talked about, which is the asymmetric risk uh, tolerance for the, which one of those three lines on the left fits your risk, combine that with all the candidate portfolios and evaluate them against the market data sets that are in here, you can find what is best. So we'll evaluate one once with you know the, the red dot market data set, um, which might look like this. Then this market data set might be this one. This market data set might be this one. So we're, we're evaluating all these possible candidate portfolios, which are legal, you know, compliant with your objective constraint, express your view. And we're evaluating them against all the possible future evolutions, not all the possible, but a large set of possible future evolutions of the market, which have preserved covariance broadly, but not perfectly, and which express your view broadly, but not perfectly. And each one represents, e each evaluation is done at a different dot in the cloud. So, you know, this, this cloud, which has now got measles, is trying to express the fact that we have evaluated all the possible candidates against a whole bunch of different market data sets, all of which are possible and, and likely. So when we want to find what the best portfolio is, we're not looking for the portfolio that is the best at this market data set, you know, a market data set, the one I've sort of squiggling on with the cursor here. Um, because you, you could find that, and then if that is exactly what happens in the future, you will do extremely well. But it is very likely that if something else happens, which is also likely to happen, you will do very badly. What you and want that's, is... That's implicitly what's being done with many scenario analysis based optimization tools. Is yeah, they're choosing yeah. one data set, shocking for that specific set of conditions, and finding the solution in that case. Yeah. And and if that case happens to be what you end up experiencing, you know, yippee, all right, good for everybody. But if you knew that in advance, again, <laughs> you don't need us. So what we want to say is, okay, this cloud shows where we could be in market data, both from a dimension of uncertainty in your forward uh, understanding or your, your alpha and in uncertainty in the covariance structure of the market. And what we want is the portfolio that across all these possible experiences is robustly stable and works well. So it's never going to be the best portfolio in a given single situation, but it is going to be a very good portfolio across lots of situations. Because you don't never you never know exactly what you're going to experience, right? No matter how much you, you tell your LPs and your CIO, I know this is going to happen. Well, it, it could happen to be the best portfolio in that situation, but it would be happenstance. Yeah, and that's, be, I think, a, an important differentiation. It's not impossible, it's just that it's not the Intent, it, it's not the intention ex ante. Exactly. And when you look back ex post, and I'm putting the same slide up that we started with, that Stephen started with at the top, what do we actually see? So this is this is real data from a real client portfolio from which we ran back in December. The possible outcomes that that client could have had, so all the candidate portfolios, are all the green lines given that client's constraints around sector, country, currency, um, uh, constraints around risk, constraints around um, uh, capital, and all, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so the client had chosen 40 or 50 assets, I can't remember, and had a bunch of constraints and could have experienced any of those green lines. The client actually, the client's portfolio, which we tracked, actually would have experienced the red line, which is around about the 50th percentile of all possible portfolios. And that is very, very standard with um, institutional level asset management. Uh, the PMs are doing the best they can to create a portfolio without 
necessarily having all the tools in, in place to, to calculate it correctly. And they kind of achieve around right about the 50th percentile. The Sherpa approach, so the approach of evaluating all those possible green lines against all the possible market data sets that live in here, resulted in the blue line. And again, this is very, very typical. We typically take what would be a 50th percentile of possible outcomes to a 70th percentile of possible outcomes. So the point of all this is not to go from the 50th percentile to the 100th percentile. That, that's just not possible. That's kind of what Stephen was saying earlier. I mean, it might happen, but that's just you being very lucky. But the point is that you can consistently take the X post performance of your portfolio from where it would be, which typically will be around about the 50th if you've thought about it but ne don't necessarily have the tools, to the 70th, which is where you'd be if you think about it and use the tools and process and the, the, the approach that uh, Sherpa does. So the whole point of this thing, again, right, we evaluate candidate portfolios on the asymmetric risk profile that matches your business across market data sets that have uncertainty in covariance and future returns, but broadly reflect your views to generate a portfolio which will be good across multiple possible evolutions of the future. And then when you do that back at the beginning, play it forward over time, you find that you have gone from typically a 50th percentile expression or, or possible set of returns to a 70th percentile without increasing risk. Right? That's the really part. Right? We haven't increased your risk. We haven't increased your volatility or your drawdown, we've just given you a better expression of your view and a more controlled uh, portfolio that works better for you. So that's really the, the kind of end of where we are. We've got a few minutes left um, and any, you know, you can go onto the, the chat and throw any questions up there. Um, but I really want to say, I don't know, Stephen, if you're still with us. Um, we are. I say yep, thank still you. here. Good, good. From my side, thank you very much indeed for uh, listening to this. I hope you found this interesting, uh, uh, and I hope you can think about how you might want to use this sort of approach in the way that you uh, run uh, risk-taking portfolios. Yeah, and I think, Richard, thanks so much for walking through that, because the, the core of, of what we want to make sure that we convey here to, to anyone who's, who's looking at how they construct their portfolio, whether you fully adopt how we view that at Sherpa or otherwise, is that practically speaking, when you think about what you mean by the best portfolio, you need to define both a, a metric for evaluation, which portfolios you're evaluating and which states of the market you're evaluating them in. And so if you have those three components, whether you, you know, if you use and, and reduce this to a sharp ratio, <laughs> um, but you're th consciously deciding what the conditions in the market are, what the market data sets that you're evaluating those potential sharp ratios against, you're already putting yourself a step ahead of just looking at historical data, of just looking at a snapshot in time without necessarily querying or, or sort of breaking down the assumptions that go into what data am I evaluating this against? And so there's a lot of ways to, to, you know, to slice this. There's a lot of different ways in terms of how you think about the metric. We obviously have a way that, you know, we implement that we have, you know, plenty of track record here that I think speaks of good results. But these are the, the critical things that you need to be thinking about when you think about, when you say that I want to build the best portfolio or that I just want to build a better portfolio, you have to be explicit with what you mean which portfolios, how are you evaluating it, and against what data. Um, so one question, Richard, that I know we get frequently when we talk about this, um, and I think you, it's on one of the slides, but I'm not sure you had a chance to cover it. Um, you know, how do, how do you think about edge cases? How do you think about portfolios that are you know, either very good in some cases and maybe not so good in the other? How do you balance sort of the interplay between a portfolio that's consistently 65th or 70th percentile versus a portfolio that's on average 65th or 70th percentile uh, with a lot greater degree of variation? 
Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, how do we do it specifically? We well, broadly, right? T typically, we. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a balance, as you said, right? You 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 can you can set your your mathematics up to hunt for the one that has the the portfolio that's evaluated across all these dots that has the highest return but the lowest volatility, or the one that has the lowest average uh, uh, volatility, or in much like you can kind of think of it in that kind of sharp ratio type thing, but it's a wee extension of it. Um, we have found empirically, and, and I don't have any theoretical background for this, but we have found empirically that the way we do it, which is looking at portfolios that perform in the top quartile, but not in the top five percentile across everything, is the, the best way of doing it. And there's probably some clever, you know, PhD there, a PhD topic that you could do there saying what that's inferring about the consistency of market covariance structure. Um, we, we honestly are not going to pursue that anymore, although you know, PhD candidates give me a shout. Um, but the empirical results we have show that that going from your 50th to your 70th percentile um, works consistently best when we use that approach. So look for portfolios that are never in the top five percentile of possible candidates at any point, but are consistently in the top quartile at all points. Yeah, which I, I you know, I think, and that's a, it traces back to a point that I was, I was discussing with a client the other day, which he was saying when he thinks about risk, he really never wants to have big days, big upside days, yeah. because to him, big upside days imply that he is taking a degree of risk that he could have commensurately large downside days. And, you know, that that's the, the coin. And again, that's something, like you say, that you can set up the math for as long as you're aware of what you're looking for. And as long as you're aware of what you want, whether you want the higher variance or whether you want one that is consistently good, fundamentally, you know, I think we philosophically <laughs> believe in being good, being above average, being 70th, 75th, 80th percentile consistently, rather than alternating wildly between the 40th and the 90th. Um, and so, okay, well, so I, Richard, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, I, we try to keep these webinars for those of you who are new fairly brief uh, because we know everybody's busy. So again, um, if you have any questions about how we approach finding the best portfolio, if you have questions about the, the details of how we take thousands of candidate portfolios, thousands of market data sets, and throw them together into a bowl and come out with a good portfolio, um, by all means, reach out to us. You know, our website, SherpaFundsTech.com, you can find more information. You're welcome to shoot us an email, give us a phone call. And certainly, uh, for those of you who joined us late, because I saw a few people uh, didn't make it at 1130 sharp, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, if you joined us late, by all means, uh, we will be sending out an email with the replay link. It will be up on our Sherpa Funds Tech YouTube page with our previous Process Alpha webinars. Um, so, Richard, any last comments before we sign off? No, just saying thank you very much indeed to all of you attending. And thank you also, Stephen, for all the hard work in putting this stuff together and getting everybody together for the, for the webinar. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for everyone attending. For those of you who are with me here in the U.S., um, thanks for staying up late. I hope there's a glass of wine in your future. And we will look forward to seeing everyone next time. And thanks from, uh, thanks from Sherpa. Cheers, guys.